tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Rachel sat alone amongst the dilapidated pews strewn carelessly on the church floor. It had been longer than she cared to remember since she had visited the church, and time had not been kind to the once warming embrace of its dimly lit walls. Now it stood frozen in time as a relic of a bygone age, one filled with love and compassion, all too quickly forgotten. The air reeked of plants and animal feces. She could hear the faint scurry of little feet carrying themselves to the safety of a secluded corner or under a nearby root. The elements had eroded all her favorite murals, and the windows only housed shards of the shattered stained glass she had enjoyed looking at. Typically, they would be beaming a rainbow of colors into the church halls, but now they sat vacant and as dark as the rest of the building itself. It had taken years to find this place. She stumbled upon it by accident while trekking through her old town. Like the rest of the abandoned buildings, it had been swallowed up by the ever-encroaching wilderness surrounding the city. She had checked a few other buildings, but no sign of life was left. The roads were riddled with potholes, vines, and fallen trees. The buildings she could see were beyond the point of repair. Her fond memories of here had been devoured just as the rest of the town was. She couldn't remember the people's names or faces, just the veil of sadness that hung over each of their faces. She looked around at the pews that sat motionless exactly where they were when she left. Some had been toppled over and others had been pushed into walls. The church hall itself was already a battlefield before it had been left to rot. There was no closure to be found here, at least the closure she sought. She wouldn't get the forgiveness she hoped for from the empty voices that now sat silently among the ruins. The peace of listening to the darkened nightlife of the forest was not as comforting as she had hoped. The very wildlife itself seemed to repulse at her presence. Rachel had noticed sitting here that the noises of crickets and birds had slowly dimmed to an almost inaudible level. All she heard now was the door creaking in the wind as it gently tapped against the stonework every few seconds. There was no telling how long she waited in that church, ruminating on the transgressions that led her to return here. Her whole life was betrayal after betrayal. People could never trust her and had always found her presence a torment. She had longed for one thing, peace. But here she was again, sitting alone among the wreckage of her past. Do you seek forgiveness? A voice came from a darkened corner of the room. Rachel raised her head and squinted to make out the frame of another woman, barely visible among the foliage in darkness. The only light source was the moon that trickled in through the smashed windows. The woman didn't step forward but repeated herself. Do you seek forgiveness? I would never presume to believe I am worthy of such things, Rachel responded. The woman stepped into the light shaft before her and revealed her half-missing face. You would be correct. I cannot give you what you seek. None of us can. As she finished, other people emerged from the shadows. All were covered in a litany of grotesque injuries, but none showed any sign of being impaired by such things. A man who held one arm in the hand of the other, a young boy whose neck was cut open, and another woman had multiple bullet wounds. They all wore what would be considered modern clothes for the early 1940s. Why would you come back? The young boy asked. Rachel turned to look at him. I always come back. It just takes me some time, but I always come back was once not enough? The older man asked. Rachel paused before answering. Once is all it ever takes, but I am compelled to return. I cannot help it. How can I be punished if I don't come back to bear witness? You bore witness when you caused this, the older man yelled at Rachel while he flailed his arms towards her. A tear rolled down Rachel's brown cheek. 
You don't understand, she said. We understand just fine. You are a blight, a cancerous stain on the world. You were welcomed into our community and you brought only death. The woman responded. What would you have me do? I cannot fix the past, Rachel pleaded. We would have you leave. Do you think we would want to see you again? You are lucky that it's just us. There are plenty of others who would have harsher words, the older man said. Your words are not what I'm looking for. Rachel rose from her seat as she spoke. Then what do you want from us? The young girl said. I only want for you to stay here and suffer as I do, Rachel said before leaving the church. You traveled all this way just to ensure we were still stuck here? The older man asked, confused. Rachel had one hand on the door on her way out. Consider it a gift. Given the alternatives are a coin flip, and given what you all did, I would say you were going to land tails anyway. Rachel slammed the door on the church behind her as she left. The brisk winter's air chilled her to the bone before she could adequately put her black coat back on. She pulled up the sheep's wool collar and ventured back through the town. The earlier empty windows and door frames were now filled with the images of their occupants. Each one hurled obscenities and vulgarities at her. Their words were the only weapons they had left to use. You couldn't leave us in peace here. You had to come back for seconds. One man yelled from his broken down porch. A pox upon you and everyone you love. Another woman screamed out as she hung from the window frame backwards. All I ever wanted was to grow up and I'll never get that because of you. A young boy yelled in a teary broken voice. Rachel kept moving, reminding herself the dead were nothing but anger and remorse. Their words, while accurate, didn't matter. She turned back to look at the border of the town. It wasn't even visible among the tree line. She hoped it would be the last time she would visit this one. After a weary and lonely journey, Rachel finally returned to the closest thing to civilization, a town barely fit enough to be considered one, but it still managed to be big enough for a small motel. She approached the front glass door and gave it a small knock. A haggard man came from behind a wooden door and buzzed her inside. The heady scent of tobacco permeated the air despite the best efforts of the window rattler in the corner pumping in cold, but not fresh air. Just for the night, he asked, fumbling over the paperwork on the front desk. Do you have one just for a few hours? She asked, leaning over the counter. He looked up at her swirling amber eyes and felt his gaze transfixed on hers. The words wouldn't come out of his mouth. No matter how hard he tried to say no, he couldn't get the words past his lips. Just a few hours? It's all I ask for, she asked again. Just a few hours, sure, the old man replied in a monotone voice. He lifted up a set of keys and handed them over. Thank you so much, Rachel responded with a tiny smile. She made her way down past the occupied rooms. Each darkened window flicked on its lights as she strolled past. Once she made it to her room, she stopped momentarily to take in the sounds. What was once a night so quiet you could hear a pin drop was now choked in screams and rage-filled moans of the other patrons. Accusatory tones and lamp smashes echoed over the parking lot. Rachel waited out the yelling and listened for the next part. The yelling matches escalated so quickly now. At first it was muffled begging, which then gave way to deathly screams and a few gunshots. Then it was quiet again. Rachel entered the motel room, slumped on the bed, and pushed off her boots, the soles of which were almost completely worn down. A thin sheet of rubber was between her and the pavement underneath her feet. No rest for the wicked, a woman's voice came from the bathroom. Never is, but you know that already, don't you? Rachel replied. She didn't bother opening her eyes as she lay on the bed. She could feel the woman lie down on the bed beside her, there was a silence that felt like it went on forever between them. Do you grow tired of this? The woman asked. I've been tired for a long time. Eventually, you just give in to it. 
Rachel responded. So why, Rachel? Why not j- Don't say that name. Why not? You're not Rachel. I'm whoever I need to be, and it isn't her. Not ever again. There was another eerie silence between the two. Rachel kept her eyes closed and didn't budge an inch. She felt the bed lighten as the other woman got up. Rachel shot out of bed and turned to see the long brown-haired woman returning to the bathroom. Will you ever give me a second chance? She pleaded. Do you think you deserve one yet? The woman responded, stopping in the doorway. It's been long enough. I've seen enough. I've lived enough. Rachel replied. You've got the opportunity I never did then. Why can't you see that for the blessing it is? the woman said before disappearing into the bathroom. Rachel knew better than to try and follow. She wouldn't be there. I loved you. I loved you more than any of the others. I made a simple mistake. I trusted the wrong people. Rachel stood at the door, tears welling up in her eyes. You come back time and again just to taunt me. Don't you think I suffer enough being stuck here without you? Rachel held on to a flint glimmer of hope as she clicked the door handle open and slowly pulled it back. Before she could glimpse inside, a voice boomed from inside the room. Betrayer! It roared, and with it, a torrent of wind sent her careening into the wall behind her. She looked up just in time to see the silhouette of the woman who had just left, hanging lifeless before she disappeared in front of her. Rachel picked herself back up and grabbed her worn shoes. She wasted no time putting them back on and headed outside. There were a few police cars around with officers investigating the scenes of carnage scattered around the motel. A nearby police officer began to walk up to her with a finger held up, hoping to stop her. He, however, stopped dead in his tracks. Then he turned around and walked up to his partner, writing notes near the car. Why would you sleep with her, man? He yelled as he slammed the notepad out of his partner's hands. What are you talking about? The partner responded. I'm talking about my wife. You slept with her. Are you serious? I didn't sleep with your wife. You're lying piece of trash. The officer didn't wait for a reply and swung at the other officer. Suddenly both were on the ground, each giving as good as the other. Neither was holding back from blocking and was simply trying to kill the other. Betrayer! One screamed before pulling his gun and unloading almost the entire magazine into the other. His eyes glazed over as he looked down at his partner's lifeless body. Rachel came over and put a hand on his shoulder. It'll all be over quick, she said softly to the officer while she pulled his gun up to his temple. You're so lucky. The bullet penetrated his skull and she had positioned herself so it went straight through hers too. He fell to the floor and blood poured from the wound. She, however, continued to stand. The gaping wound in her forehead sealed back over. No rest for the wicked, she repeated aloud. The first officer stood beside her. Confused, he looked down at both their bodies. Why is it just me? he asked. Murder and betrayal are what hold us here. He gets a ticket to move on. Rachel responded. That's not fair, though, the man replied. Life isn't fair, and neither is the afterlife, Rachel replied before walking away. So what now? Nothing, but I'll probably see you again in a few decades. It depends on when I get drawn back. I'm sure you'll be stewing with anger at me. It's what I deserve. It only took her a few days to reach another small town. News spread faster and faster these days, and the trail of bodies she left in her wake was beginning to draw eyes. She didn't pick where she went. She had to go where she was drawn to, her ever-walking curse. Finally, her deeds had caught up to her. As she approached the town, she could see a small blockade of police cars. One of the officers called out to her over a megaphone. Stop where you are. We don't want to hurt you. We just want you to stop so we can ask you some questions. Rachel looked over at them with continued footsteps. The row of cars each barricaded a few officers with their weapons drawn. Her footsteps were quickly muffled as a helicopter approached the horizon, shining a blinding searchlight directly on her. 
she covered her face from the light and wind from the aircraft. It pulled back after one of the officers signaled for it to move around and give them some room. However, it wasn't one of theirs. It was a news crew and she felt the camera trained right on her. There was a moment's hesitation before she looked up at the camera. Once it pulled back, the wind picked up and pushed her long hair out of her face, revealing the swirling amber eyes. She couldn't hear the officer's words, but she could hear the gunshots. The helicopter kept itself steady until it began to swing and veer. An apparent scuffle ensued inside, but the camera had taken enough of a look at her that she knew what it meant. People had ignored and hated her for as long as she lived. Now the entire world would bear witness. Every television set, every mobile phone, every computer screen. She was being spread across all of them, the face of betrayal sweeping the globe. The woman from earlier stepped out of a nearby house behind the police cars. Rachel's vision was obscured by the flashing lights. You've done enough, Judy, the woman called out. I never wanted any of this, she responded. Then you shouldn't have helped them put me on that cross. I was weak. I never thought it would end like this. Now look where we are. The woman stepped into the light, revealing her brown face and similarly colored eyes. The darkened, dirt-stained robe hung over her body. They're free to make their choice as were you. You could have stopped at any time but always felt compelled to walk on. Do you know what that is? Because you made me do it, Rachel screamed in anger. No, you did. You put this punishment on yourself. You put this punishment on everyone. You just had to forgive yourself, but instead, you look for it in everyone else. Rachel dropped to her knees. Please, Jess, just let me rest. Not until you can forgive yourself. I loved you too, you know. Did you ever think about how I felt knowing you gave me up? Jess disappeared among the flashing lights. Rachel finally stopped and sat on the bitumen. Flashing lights occasionally brightened her vision. The distant echoes of fighting subsided. She took a few deep breaths and looked up at the night sky. I don't deserve this. Neither did you. But I've suffered enough. I forgive you, Judy. She spoke the last words and collapsed to the ground. What began as a wretched weekend for Preston Allstott was turning out most glorious. His elation would have invariably been lost on the casual observer who did not share his passion for botany, but knee-deep in the brackish muck of the Everglades, leeches, gators, and fist-sized mosquitoes aside, he was reborn. Preston had woke on the last day of class, planning to work through spring break. His Friday morning took a turn for the worse when he discovered a pipe in his kitchen had burst. His car would not start, and then he learned Harvard no longer required the talents of two fellow biologists in the upcoming year. With untold semesters to go before he could even hope for the security of tenure, Preston thought his position was threatened. He needed to publish, or at least contribute to some credible research to bolster his resume if he were to have any chance of staying with the university. But he had no idea where to begin. It was all too much. Preston had to get away. He called his contractor, worked out where to leave the key, and taxied to the airport. Five hours later, he was on a red eye to Florida. Preston considered calling his research team, but the trip was supposed to be a casual getaway, not an expedition. Janie, he thought. She should have been part of his team, but she'd refused to accompany him on the last leg of his doctoral pursuit, choosing to stay in Ithaca. By sophomore year, Janie told him that she would always be his second most loved carbon-based life form. They still talked once per month by phone, but hadn't been face to face or body to body in over six years. Ever since, Preston was married to his work 
and he made no apologies. Human relationships had always been too difficult. Plants were easy. They lived and died. In the interim, they waged a silent war for survival, doing their damnedest to choke out competitive species for territorial dominance. Emotions were never involved. There was no need for conversation or compromise. Plants were content to be alone. Six years hadn't helped him forget. Preston was still thinking of Janie as his plane taxied the tarmac. Preston took full advantage of the hotel's continental breakfast, then showered and slathered on sunscreen. After grabbing a folder full of ungraded midterms in the complimentary Miami Herald, he headed to the beach. It was spring break, and the college tourists that had bombarded the city still had a few more hours before they would depart, zombie-like, for their hotels, leaving the oceanfront suspiciously devoid of sunbathers. An hour later, Preston had only trudged through three midterms. It was difficult to focus. Peeling himself from his chair, he waded into the blue-green Atlantic. Diving under the waves, Preston made his way past the breakers. He followed the tide to buoy him as he lay backward. Eyes closed, he floated, mentally riffling through rare orchid species. It was a form of yoga he'd first utilized years ago. Symbidium sinense, indigenous to India, Taiwan, and Thailand, found in cool climates and requires ample light with lower temperatures. Thrives in an ideal humidity between 40 and 60%. Catlia schillerania, Brazil, grows in cool to hot temperatures on cliff faces and in rivers anywhere from sea level to 800 meters above, often used to create hybrids in attempts to breed super orchids. Dendrophylax lindeni, first found in Cuba in 1844, discovered in South Florida 50 years later, commonly known as the ghost orchid due to its billowy white appearance. 2,000 known to exist in the state, their location mostly kept secret by researchers and horticulturalists, considered the most sought after orchid in the world. Preston opened his eyes at the realization, losing the poise of his float posture. South Florida? He was in South Florida. Within 40 minutes, he could be in the heart of Big Cypress Swamp. He couldn't believe he hadn't thought of it sooner. He could find a ghost orchid. Bringing one back would be tantamount to sacrilege, but if he got the chance to study one in the wild, to even see one, it would spark inspiration for his next project and save his position at Harvard. Preston dug his cell phone from his bag. Dialing information, he asked for airboat companies. He stopped the operator at the third listing. The operator connected him directly. Fandango Airboat Tours. Best gator gazing gateway in the glades. A grappley voice on the other end extolled. Mo speaking. May I help you? Do you have tours going out today? Sure do, Mo replied. Preston waited expectantly. What time? he asked, realizing Mo wasn't volunteering additional information. Time you want to leave? Mo asked, after an audible sip and swallow. Uh, how about around noon? Preston suggested, caught it off guard at the man's nonchalance. He wondered if all the natives were as casual. Nah, noon's no good. Too damn hot. How about, let's say, four? Sun'll be lower. Mo countered. Four it is, Preston agreed. Listen, is there any chance this could be a private tour? be private today. Spring breakers don't care about air boating. Ain't no sex or booze in it. He paused. Well, no sex anyway. Unless a couple of them co-eds show up and play their cards right.
Preston arrived at Fandango 15 minutes early. There wasn't much to the place. The tiny shack had an attached pavilion that barely covered two picnic tables. An old cash register sat atop a weathered bar. Two t-shirts, one red, one black, hung on coat hangers dangling from the rafters. The sun-bleached shirts proudly displayed the white Fandango logo. An airboat driven by an oversized, bespeckled alligator, sunglasses resting on his snout. A graying, rotund man wearing a trucker's cap with the same logo emerged from the shack. His name was embroidered on his black polo. Mo. Howdy, friend. You must be my four o'clock. Mr. Uh, uh, doctor, actually, Preston corrected. Dr. Preston Alstott. My apologies, Mo said, extending his hand. MD? Professor of Botanical Sciences at Harvard, Preston said, shaking the large man's hand. An Ivy League plant man. Hmm. Funny. I, I suppose so, Preston agreed. Surprised he'd never made the same connection. You must be here on business, considering your request for a private ride, Mo surmised. Uh, correct. I'm, uh, I'm hoping to find... A ghost orchid? Mo finished for him. It was quickly becoming apparent that despite the man's yokel appearance, he was no dummy. I can probably help you with that, but it'll cost a little more. How uh, about we say a hundred? That won't be a problem, Preston assured him, pulling his wallet from his back pocket. Card readers on the fritz, Mo said when he saw Preston thumbing a visa. Oh, sure. Preston fished out the cash. Alrighty then, Mo said, pocketing the bills as he headed back inside the shack. He re-emerged with a hefty red and white cooler in his right hand. In his left, he carried a bag of jumbo marshmallows. Okay, Professor. Let's ride. Fifteen minutes later, they were speeding through the swamp. The boat tore through a swarm of mayflies. The insects peppered Preston's face like scattered buckshot. He'd never been so thankful for sunglasses. Sorry about that, Doc, Mo yelled over the sound of the whining propeller. Trying to avoid some brush on the left. Stilted red mangroves threw roots in intricate patterns across the swamp floor. Preston was impressed at how well Mo was dodging the trees. We only need a couple inches of water and... But we can still snag anything too stout or dry, Mo called out. The combined speed, gas fumes, and frequent zigzagging weighed on Preston. How much further? He yelled. Half hour, maybe a little more. Your thumb ain't the only thing green right now, Doc. Here, I'll pull over for a sec. Let you get your gut right. Mo killed the throttle. Turning the propeller handle, he guided the boat into a culvert. The fan blades whirred to a stop as the boat drifted slowly. <sighs> Thanks, Preston said, his stomach appreciative. Examining the perimeter, he spied bladderworts, water lilies, and spatter docks. Preston saw a trickling ripple swirl to the left of the boat. What was that? He asked anxiously. That, Mo said, leaning over the side of the boat, is Big Al. He's a local legend in these parts. Al? As in... Uh, you came by that doctor an honest bag on, Mo said, opening the bag of marshmallows. Yeah, old Al is about 18 feet worth of gator. Most folks figure he's about 60 years old. Most gators grow to about 11 and check out. He's what a fellow like you would probably call an anomaly. Preston craned his neck. He watched Mo, trying to follow the older man's searching eyes. Something so large should have been easier to find. Staring off the rear of the boat, Mo plucked a marshmallow from the bag and held it over the water. You may want to scoop back, Professor, Mo said. 
Preston inched back as far as his seat allowed. He tensed, feeling sweat drip down his back. The sun may have weakened, but the humidity was as thick as ever. He'd forgotten it while the boat was cutting through the swamp, the headwind drying his skin. Mo clicked his tongue as casually as if he were summoning a house cat. Here, gator, gator, gator. With a violent splash, Big Al broke the water, lunging upward for Moe's outstretched arm. The gator's moss-green head was easily the size of a curbside garbage can, its yellow teeth thick as fingers gnarled like splayed barbed wire. Big Al unhinged his bottom jaw so wide that it looked as if he could swallow Moe whole. At the last possible second, the old boatman dodged backward, letting the marshmallow fly. The gator snatched it from the air and fell back into the water, sending a swell under the boat that nearly capsized it. Preston pitched backward in a vinyl seat, clutching it tightly. Mo cackled. <laughs> you all right, Doc? Man, you should have seen your face. Preston couldn't speak. He really wanted to, so he could ask Mo just what the hell was wrong with him and why he would endanger both their lives for such a stupid stunt. But his lips wouldn't work. Mo offered the bag to Preston. Your turn. Give it a shot? No, no, uh, no, thank you, Preston stammered. His eyes were wide as he frantically scanned the water. <laughs> Suit yourself. Mo said. You don't know what you're missing. Is... is he coming back? Not unless I offer him another. Please, don't, Preston begged. Mo chuckled. <laughs> I'm sorry, Doc. It's just a gag I use with the tourists. They, they get a kick out of it. Of course, uh, you don't usually do it with Al. He can be a little intimidating. Genghis Khan was a little intimidating. Big Al would have made him soil his fur-lined panties, Preston said dryly. Mo grinned, reached into the cooler, and popped the top off a beer, shoving it at Preston. <laughs> have one. It'll calm your nerves. Staying low, Preston took as few steps as possible to accept the offer. Thanks, he said. Don't worry. She ain't gonna tip over, Mo assured him. Tell you what, I'll get us back out onto the main, and we can troll a bit before we pick up speed again. Great. Mo fiddled with buttons on what Preston recognized as the engine. Pulling a ripcord, the fan blade spun to life. He reached for the rudder, gently guiding the boat into the open swamp. Preston sipped his beer. It was bitter. He studied the label. Swamp Ape IPA. Yeah, it's brewed up in Melbourne, Mo said. It's good, Preston lied. Bet your ass it is. Just like everything in Florida. Except the damn Cubans. Preston shot him an uncomfortable glance. No offense, Mo quickly added. None taken. Preston pulled his cell phone from his pocket. Eleven minutes after five. How long until the orchids? He asked. Depends how you're feeling, Mo replied. I'm good. We can pick up speed anytime. Relax, Doc. Enjoy the scenery. You ain't paying by the hour, and you're still looking a little green. Preston swatted a mosquito from his neck, wishing he'd stop for repellent. The Spanish were the first to ever map the glades, though they hadn't even seen it. Mo began in full tour guide mode, speaking just loud enough that Preston could hear him over the sound of the engine. They knew there was something between the Gulf and the Atlantic, but they didn't know exactly what. They named it Laguna del Espirito Santo, Lake of the Holy Spirit. Right. I read that in the brochure, Preston said. The primary vegetation here is obviously sawgrass, which has some interesting characteristics. For example, sawgrass leaves will burn. But not the submerged roots, Preston said. 
It's how the sawgrass survives all the fires caused by lightning strikes. Sharp cookie, Mo said. Preston smiled. That is kind of my area of expertise, he said with an air of pride. How about a little history lesson then? Please, Preston said, less anxious. I'm sure you're familiar with the lost colony of Virginia. Sure. They were the last members of modern-day North Carolina's Roanoke Colony, who disappeared. When other settlers came looking for them, they found all their homes and buildings dismantled. The only clue to their disappearance was the word Croatoan, carved into a nearby tree, Preston said, as if he were lecturing back at Harvard. What happened? Mo asked. Well, there are two theories. Some scholars believe the group was signaling that they were relocating to Croatoan Island, what we now know as Hatteras Island. And the other theory? The colonists were trying to point to a tribe that abducted them. That's highly unlikely, though, Preston said, leaning into the boat as it cut to the right. You think so? How would someone have the wits or the time to carve something like that into a tree during a mass kidnapping? Oh, you'd be surprised what fear can do, Mo said, finishing his beer. What if I told you we had our own little lost colony right here in the glades? I didn't realize there were colonists here. Not colonists, per se. Indians. I mean, Native Americans. Go on, Preston said, setting his empty swamp ape bottle in the bottom of the boat. Mo tossed him another. Mo cleared his throat. <clears throat> Initially, there were two major tribes in the glades, the Calusa and the Tequesta. The Calusa were the big boys. Several thousand of them lived here, but they suffered attacks from an invading Yamasi tribe from the north. Less than a thousand survived. Most fled with the Spanish explorers who relocated them to Cuba. But when disease started killing them off, they moved to the Keys. The Tequesta were supposedly a peaceful bunch, but the Spanish were scared shitless. Said the Tequesta ambushed their sailors who ran aground in the glades and would torture them to death. Half a decade later, Spanish priests tried to build missions along the coast, figuring they might be able to convert them. Turns out another invading tribe, the Yuchi, took care of that problem instead. Between them and the Seminoles, the Tequesta were nearly wiped out. Around 1770, a British historian found most of their villages leveled. Legend has it that the final 30 surviving Tequesta were deported to Havana. Most folks around here don't believe that, though. So what do they think happened? Preston asked between swallows. Well, nobody really knows, but this flower you're looking for? The old timers around here swear those dead Indian spirits are what gives those things life. So you're saying the Tequesta put the ghost in the ghost orchid? Preston said, feebly suppressing a grin. I'm just telling you what folks believe. That's why they say those orchids are so rare, so special. They think the Tequesta's spirits inhabit the orchids and protect them. Sort of the last piece of their property they don't want to lose, Mo explained. Well, I've heard some interesting theories on plant development, but that's a new one to me. Mo revved the throttle gently and motioned for Preston to steady himself. All I know is that you don't get to be old by being stupid. As the time passed, the beer proved to be a double-edged sword. It undoubtedly helped make the trip more enjoyable, but it seemed to have stolen Mo's recollection of the orchid's location. Preston cut himself off at three. He wanted to be lucid when, if, they found the orchids. He'd lost count of how many Mo had finished, or how many times he'd followed dead ends. Still, his control of the airboat seemed unfazed. Preston took out his cell phone to check the time, but the battery was dead. 
the last thing he'd seen on it was a notification of a voicemail from his contractor. He simply replied, Fix it, in text. He estimated that it was close to 8 o'clock. The sun had set about a half hour earlier and twilight streaked the sky. How much longer? I'm pretty sure they're just up around that bend there. Preston followed Moe's gesture, spying the outline of a tiny outcropping. Yep, won't be long now. Preston restrained his anticipation. Though Moe had been good company, his navigational track record had proven less than stellar. The time hadn't been a total waste. Talking about the Everglades' history was the lengthiest conversation he'd had with anyone, not even talks with Janie. And there she was again, right where he left her, waiting in the back of his mind. Mo idled the boat into the cove. We're here, he gestured toward the sawgrass before them. May I present the Florida Ghost Orchid? Hundreds of ghost orchids, as white as they were in every picture Preston had seen, danced in the gently lapping water. He was moved to tears. You okay, Professor? My God, there's so many. There are only supposed to be 2,000 in the state, Preston said, his attention unwavering. Well, that may have been all they've found, but that don't mean that's all there is. When you've been running the glades as long as I have, you learn a few secrets. Mo eased the boat closer, allowing Preston a better look. There's enough ground there to walk right out and touch one. He pointed to the 20 feet of mud-covered bank in front of the boat. Seriously? Aren't there gators out there? Preston asked, captivated by the opportunity. Hell, Doc, there's gators everywhere around here. Just don't stay too long. I'll keep the light on and holler if I see anything. Preston tossed his wallet and phone in the boat, then eased his way out onto the marshy beach. He swapped his vision between the orchids and the watery slop that came up to his knees, in case Big Al, or one of his cousins, chose to make an appearance. But there, that close... He was more excited than afraid. He reached out and cradled an orchid. Its petals, sepals, and lobes all fluttered in perfect unison. Its fluted stigma stood proud, displaying elegance amongst strength. My God, Preston repeated, laughing joyously. <laughs> Mo, you've got to come see this up close. This is unbelievable. No thanks, Mo said. I'll pass. Preston heard the boat's motor start back up, but he couldn't take his eyes off the orchids. All right, Doc. It's been real. Second thought, stay a while. I think you'll like it here. Mo called out as he opened the engine full bore. Preston turned. The shrill hum and sudden gust of the fan disrupted his stupor. He lunged after the reversing boat, taking two steps, and then plummeted face first into the waist high water. Panic and confusion overtook him. He tried to swim after Mo, but was tossed aside by the boat's churning wake. Preston screamed, begging Mo to return until he lost sight of the spotlight. Terrified and alone in the blackness, he slid back through the ooze to the company of the orchids. Scratching blindly in the muck, Preston scrambled as high on the bank as possible to escape the reach of any gators. He found the root of a mangrove and held on for dear life trying to get his feet on land. A guttural murmur came from the left. He froze and listened. A moment later, it warbled again, louder an echo answered from behind him followed by another within seconds terrifying sounds surrounded him Preston tried to run but tumbled back into the marsh he stayed under for as long as he could 
hoping the noise would be gone when he surfaced. For a moment, the noises sounded like a language, an ancient, lost language unfamiliar to Preston. He rose from the water, working towards the shore, then stopped dead in his tracks. The glow of tiny red dots danced in the darkness. They bounced within yards of him before disappearing. Suddenly, the small pair of lights came back, joined by other pairs. Eyes, Preston thought. He stood, water seeping into his very core. Dozens of different colored eyes stared at him, glowing yellow, orange, and red. Something brushed past his legs, snapping him back into reality. He thrashed in the water, trying to find the mangrove to back against. Silence and stillness returned. All the eyes disappeared. Preston clambered up onto the roots of the tree. He had imagined it all. It, it, it must have been some type of a fish against his leg and fireflies in the trees. Most stories had gotten the better of him but it wouldn't get the best. He was a man of science, after all. Suddenly, dozens of moss-covered hands reached up, took hold, and pulled Preston beneath the liquid black. He thrashed, kicking and screaming, his bubbling voice sounding much like those of his now screaming tormentors. Reds, Oranges and yellows flashed around him as he was pulled into the bowels of the swamp, mud and water filling his nose, eyes, and lungs. Preston ceased struggling as the strong hands gently guided him deeper into the mud. When he opened his eyes, he could see clearly. Everything was in shades of yellow. Vines snaked around him piercing his flesh in excruciating precision. Slimy vegetation slithered down his throat, nesting his organs in floral incubators. Roots slowly replaced his bones. Preston heard the process in his mind, the sentient screams of his dying cells and the triumphant battle cries of the new organisms conquering his body. Then came the voices of his brothers, warm and inviting, as they began to hoist him from the murk. He finally understood them all. Still, he tried holding on. He tried salvaging what was left of himself, of Preston. Why resist, he wondered. All his fears were fading. This was everything he had ever wanted. Preston wasn't alone anymore. But then he thought of Jenny. Jamie. Janet. Jan. What was it again? Valen Forest. Derbyshire, 1984. I sat in the driver's seat of my aging Ford Granada and listened to the rain pound relentlessly on the car's metal roof, a sound I had always found strangely soothing. Once the torrent subsided, I looked outside to watch late afternoon mists coil and dance across the undulating surface of the lake the rocky shore of which provided access to the cottage I would be renting for the next few weeks. Beyond the lake stood Valen Forest, where towering fir trees loomed like foreboding sentinels that swayed hypnotically in the stiff October breeze. The purpose of this solo trip was a matter of healing. I had recently finalized my divorce from my wife, Elizabeth. The separation was her idea, although there had been no great transgressions on my part. Whilst we had been steadily drifting apart for some time, the real catalyst had been the sudden death of our nine-month-old daughter, Charlotte, nearly two years previously. The reason given on her death certificate was SIDS, or Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. 
she had simply ceased breathing in her sleep. There were no warning signs to speak of and no illness to foreshadow her demise. I had awoken one night to Elizabeth screaming in Charlotte's room. When I rushed to see what the commotion was about, my mind still hazy from bourbon and sleeping pills, I found Elizabeth hysterical and cradling Charlotte's limp body in her arms. Her face was a bluish gray, her eyes barren, fingers ice cold when I held them to my cheek, devoid of the warmth normally bestowed by life. The months that followed were a nightmare for both of us. Mostly, I was on autopilot, unable to allow myself to grieve in a normal and healthy way. As a usually robust man of six feet and two hundred pounds, I quickly lost weight to the point of becoming skeletal. My complexion grew pallid, whilst my black hair and beard succumbed to premature grayness, the toll of my grief visible for all to see, even if I couldn't express it directly. Elizabeth was the direct opposite, and yielded to her anguish so completely that it consumed her. In truth, I was jealous of her ability to feel, whilst on some level, I must also admit that I resented what felt like gratuitous wallowing. I just felt a sickening emptiness every time I thought of that night and those cold, lifeless fingers against my cheek, her hands small and fragile, yet heavy with the burden of loss. Elizabeth eventually returned to some semblance of normality, working through her grief to attain a point of reluctant acceptance. I dragged myself out of the car and inhaled crisp autumn air into my lungs to clear my head. Many of the trees surrounding the lake were vibrant with rusted hues of red, brown, and gold, which stood in contrast to the evergreens of Valen Forest itself. Even from this distance, I could hear the noise of the wind as it coursed through the twisted and gnarled limbs of the woodland's inhabitants, the dense canopy shifting under strain, almost breathing as though the forest itself was a vast living entity. I turned to regard the cottage behind me, a small single-story house with weathered cream exterior walls and a dark slate roof that looked like it needed repairs in several places. I quickly locked the car, a habit of inner-city living that had no meaning in a place like this, and made my way up the cottage's gravel path. I approached the front door with its cracked black paint and fumbled for the keys the agent had given me. They were as old and corroded as the cottage itself. A paper sticker bore my name, Sean McGuire, with the collection date in Blue Bureau that was starting to streak with the rain. When I unlocked the door, it swung open lethargically on rusted hinges to reveal a dim and shadowed room beyond. The air smelled heavy and damp. I hadn't expected luxury by any means, The pictures in the brochure had prepared me for a back-to-basics lifestyle, but I still felt a sense of unease that this would be home for a while. I dragged myself and my bags inside and searched for the light switch, the single bulb adorned by a dated beige lampshade casting a subdued light. The room itself was a simple affair. A taupe sofa and chair were arranged around an old-fashioned coffee table. The heavy chimney stack contained a large black iron grate in which logs had been arranged in a triangle. A pine TV stand was placed in the corner, upon which sat a large television with a huge bulbous back. None of the furniture matched. A narrow hallway led to the bedroom, bathroom, and kitchen. The bedroom and bathroom were generously sized but the kitchen was small and awkward to maneuver around, but was sufficient for one. It was late afternoon by the time I had unpacked and got myself settled. I lit the log fire to take the chill off the air and warmed up some pre-prepared food in the small gas oven that had yellowed with age. I also put on the TV for sound, to create a vague sense of company for myself. 
With the fire glowing and a few candles lit, the cottage was almost starting to feel cozy. After my meal, I stepped outside to get a feel for the surrounding area. It was dusk now, a dark purple sky tinged with wispy veins of yellow and amber. I walked down the path and made my way to the water's edge. My feet crunched satisfyingly on the rocks that formed its shoreline, and I delighted at my breath being visible in the frigid dusk air. This had always been my favorite time of year, when summer succumbed to the onset of autumn and altogether fresher conditions. The lake was vast, with still waters that reflected the hues of the sky above in a vivid and mesmerizing fashion. About the lake's perimeter were lights from the windows of cottages and farmsteads sporadically scattered around its border. These were signs of life, yet sufficiently distant to still give me that sense of isolation I craved. I will admit, however, that it was also comforting to know I wasn't completely alone out here. City people tend to romanticize rural solitude in a way that rarely accords with reality. The first few days were spent lazily unpacking my belongings and acclimatizing to the solitude of this place with occasional walks by the lake during the day and reading in front of the roaring log fire in the evening. Eventually, I felt courageous enough to explore Valen Forest itself. On the day of my planned hike, I set my alarm for 5.30 a.m., so I would have plenty of time to explore the woodland before dusk set in. I ate breakfast with strong black coffee and prepared for my excursion. I pulled on my hiking gear, including my thick mustard jumper, olive walking trousers, and padded orange jacket and filled a small rucksack with supplies. I chose to head north, away from the more populated areas, and soon came to a point where the lake narrowed into a ravine. A wooden bridge facilitated access to the other side and the sprawling forest beyond. The bridge itself was a modern affair of distinctly Nordic architecture. Upon reaching the path on the other side, I paused to survey my surroundings and soak up the peculiar atmosphere of this place. I wanted to explore the depths of this majestic forest landscape. Still, trepidation had instantly seized me, encroaching anxiety that began in the pit of my stomach to seep outwards towards my extremities causing my fingers and lips to tremble discernibly. I cursed myself for my sudden infirmity. I was not inherently anxious, so why did I suddenly apprehend such a great fear of this place? Pushing my unease aside, I followed the path that led from the bridge to make a mental note of the general direction in which to return. The thick forest allowed for little light, and a tangible gloom seemed to hang in the very air of this place. The path that I followed appeared well-trodden, and I assumed it to be a popular hiking route in the summer months. Occasionally, the landscape would thin out and relinquish scenery of such outstanding beauty that I began to develop a real sense of awe for Valen Forest. I would often stop to marvel at some sight or sound, the churning of a stream as waterfowl glided across its surface, or the sound of a distant heron or raven. I must have walked around an hour before the forest dispersed into a large clearing. I intended to rest, but something strange caught my eye, roughly ten meters from where I sat, and I edged forward cautiously to get a better look. A small stone circle had been arranged on an even and slightly elevated patch of ground. Above its perimeter were five severed fox heads, their glassy and lifeless eyes staring back at me as the breeze gently touched their matted fur. At the center of the circle were the ashen remnants of a fire. The closer I got, the more I could smell the burned incense of jasmine frankincense and patchouli. It was as though this obscene display had been the focal point of some bizarre ritual, and I assumed it was meant to serve as an altar. But to what purpose? 
Each of the heads had a substance smeared upon their brow, as if consecrated by a priest on Ash Wednesday. It was as though something sinister clung to the very air of this place. It was both invisible yet strangely tangible, and seemed to permeate my being to the point that I immediately felt infected by it. I quickly took a step back and tried to steady my breathing as my mind raced, desperately trying to rationalize the situation's absurdity. It was then that I heard the sound of something familiar, and instantly, my stomach lurched with a new terror. From the area behind the trees directly in front of me, I heard her voice for the first time in years. The sound of my baby daughter's cries. It was unmistakable, the sound particular to Charlotte, an urgent cry that usually meant that she needed to be fed or consoled. I had the sudden overwhelming urge to run towards the sound, but remained rooted to the spot, completely transfixed. The sound came again, this time sharper and more abrupt, as though she had suddenly been afflicted with pain. Although I knew it could not possibly be her, I still raised my feet slowly and moved towards the sound. When the scream of pain came again, my body was filled with a sudden impetus, not to run to the perceived source, to console my infant daughter, but to turn and flee from whatever sinister being was mimicking her and cruelly mocking my grief. I charged through the woods in the direction I had come, thankful that most of it was downhill, fear and adrenaline propelling me forward. Relief finally came as I exited the forest to collapse, exhausted, against the bridge rail, my heart pounding and my lungs on fire from the frenetic exertion. Before standing, I heard Charlotte's cries again, from deep within the forest. I immediately pulled myself to my feet and pushed onward towards the cottage. Upon my return, I raced into the kitchen and tore off my clothes, throwing them into the washing machine before heading straight for the bathroom and plunging into the shower, as though trying to remove the stain of that place. I spent the rest of the evening in a sullen state, as I dwelled relentlessly upon the sound of Charlotte's cries, old wounds afresh within my psyche. I tried everything to rationalize my experience. Could it have been a hallucination induced by the anxiety of that place? Was it a lack of sleep and food that led my mind to perceive things that were not really there? Could the cry have been the sound of an animal? There must be a rational explanation. I had sought rural isolation to find a much-needed sense of peace and freedom, only to find myself drawn into a connection with forces beyond my comprehension. Either that or my mind had finally failed me to the extent that I was actually hearing my dead infant daughter cry out from the forest. Turning in for the night, I found sleep elusive, but finally drifted into slumber sometime around midnight. I jolted violently awake, sucking in air as though I had been struggling to breathe in my sleep. The bedside clock told me it was 3 a.m. Climbing from my bed, I walked from the bedroom to the living room and opened the front door, stepping outside to draw fresh air into my lungs. Above me churned a vast night sky in ominous hues of black, whilst the wind coursed about me like a choir of unfettered whispers. I walked the short distance to the shore of the lake as I wanted to look at the forest again, where I had witnessed such strange events only hours earlier. A sharp crescent moon cast a narrow, shimmering path of light that stretched from the opposite side of the lake to where I stood, silently observing as the light flitted across the water's surface. I turned to survey my immediate surroundings the veiled shadow meadows on either side of the cottage, and the forest entrance further up the gravel path to the north. Then, 
something on the trail drew my attention, and I narrowed my eyes to try and see more clearly. A shadowy, humanoid form stood near the base of a tree on the path I had used to return home. Whilst the form was nebulous and difficult to clearly discern, its outline was unmistakably that of a female. Was it a natural formation or an actual person? My heart leapt in a painful spasm that momentarily stole my breath as the figure moved to confirm my fear that I was not alone out here. As she approached, I watched the figure gain clarity as though drawing power from the moon itself. From her featureless black face, two shining golden eyes appeared. Her body was solid yet enshrouded by a vaporous mist, like black liquid nitrogen that billowed down to her feet and then outwards to gradually dissipate in the ether. Her long, flowing garments belonged to another time. Then the sound of Charlotte's cries came again as the apparition lowered her arms, hands disappearing into her vestments to remove something pale and heavy. My stomach churned with disgust as the figure held the writhing body of my baby daughter aloft, suspended in the air by one hand that was clenched tightly around her throat, blood drawn and weeping where long fingernails had found vicious purchase. Her naked body dangled and flailed against the assault as she screamed in pain, her eyes turning towards me pleadingly her cries straining under the vice-like grip on her supple throat. I turned and fled to the sanctuary of the cottage, slamming the door behind me and flicking on the light, shaking hands clumsily securing the bolts. My legs buckled beneath me as I turned and frantically clawed my way across the floor to prop myself upright against the front of the sofa, eyes never leaving the door as the room was suddenly plunged into momentary silence. My respite was to be short-lived. Whilst the sound of Charlotte's cries had slowly receded to nothingness, I suddenly became aware of the sound of scratching at the door. Then Charlotte's cries started again as more voices came, a crescendo of layered whispers wherein individual voices were impossible to discern. Fingers began to tap on all of the windows at once, as though a group of people had surrounded the house. Anger boiled in my blood, and I summoned the strength to pick up the coffee table and throw it at the door, quickly falling to my hands and knees again with the exertion. Leave me the fuck alone! I bellowed the words, a struggle to form in my traumatized state. Suddenly, all the noises abated, and the silence was deafening, the atmosphere in the room suddenly thick with static and tension as the hairs on my body began to rise. From the corner came a new voice, one that was actually inside the house. My boy, open the door, it pleaded. I need to see you, please, Sean. It is my mother's voice, with its unmistakable heavy Irish accent. My mother passed away over a decade ago. Her voice hits me like a truck, but I know it is not her. I fled to the bedroom, slamming the door behind me and hearing the sound of laughter behind me as I did so. The sound of my mother's laughter, yet somehow different, inhuman almost, and tinged with cruelty and malice. No more sounds came that night, and I eventually pushed the bed up against the door and collapsed on it to sleep for a few precious hours. I awoke exhausted to the morning light filtering through the garish golden curtains of the cottage bedroom window. Feeling nauseous from fatigue, I pushed myself off the bed and dragged it back across the room. I found the cottage to be just as I had left it the previous night. I quickly straightened up the place and opened the window to allow some fresh air in despite the cold, as though it would somehow help cleanse the room of last night's events. 
The rest of the day was spent in a state of gnawing anxiety as I tried to rationalize my experience. Could it have been the result of sleepwalking, a waking dream? Or could it be that in such a secluded and isolated location, without the distractions of city living, the true extent of my mental decline was becoming apparent? There was no denying that there was something strange about this area. Valen Forest had a rich history of witchcraft, and was the home to the most notorious witch in British history, an unashamed demon worshipper executed in the region for the most unbelievable crimes. Whilst I have never been a believer in such things, it cannot be denied that they can exert an enormous psychological effect on people, particularly those in a vulnerable state. I questioned whether this could have influenced the visions I had experienced. I abandoned all plans of exploration that day and instead hung around the cottage drinking coffee and trying to occupy my mind. I retired early to bed at 9 p.m. and quickly succumbed to sleep. My mind was assailed by vivid nightmares, crying infants and desolate places, dark foreboding landscapes wherein skinless beings lurked in shadow yet watched with glowing eyes, their chattering teeth like the stridulation of a cricket swarm. I awoke suddenly with a violent spasm that snapped my mind into waking reality, yet I found that my body was frozen. My limbs were cold and heavy as though paralyzed, whilst saliva seeped from the corner of my mouth. It was then that I saw a dark shadow in the corner of the bedroom, like a nebulous column of black smoke that caused the air around it to distort. A noise, like a low hum or vibration, radiated from that part of the room. Her face appeared again from the black miasma, and my heart began to thunder at the sight of two radiant eye slits that opened to regard me with contempt, like a lion stalking its prey. Her form shambled forward awkwardly, as though in stop motion, as a multitude of voices came, of dying lambs and crying babies, of breaking bones and chattering teeth. I watched on helplessly as the figure loomed above me, her form slowly twisting into shape like a crooked and gnarled tree. A large hand with spindly fingers veiled my face, and I was instantly lost to the darkness. Oblivion. I awoke once more to the intrusion of dawn, and my entire body ached as I shifted myself into an upright position. No dreams lingered, No dark recollections of my time in the void. Just the vague impression of a woman's voice that echoed in my mind. I am Besleth, the Eater of Light. My mind was firm. I must escape from this place. I quickly grabbed my belongings, shoved them into my suitcases, and threw everything haphazardly into the boot of my car. Crawling into the driver's seat, I tried the ignition without even bothering to secure my seatbelt. Nothing. I tried again. Dead. Exasperated, I slammed my fist on the steering wheel and climbed back out to look inside the engine bay. I know nothing about cars, but everything seemed to be in order, with no obvious burn marks or damage. Defeated and cursing, I slammed the hood and headed for the nearest town. Wellsbrook is a typically English rural village wherein the locals are all intimately familiar with each other's lives and possess a subtle hostility towards outsiders. I located the local shop with its aged timber windows, crisp net curtains, and a chalkboard outside indicating that you could get fresh eggs, bread, and milk daily. Approaching the counter, I found a heavy-set ginger-haired gentleman with a full beard hunched over the counter, reading a newspaper that was set between two chunky and freckled forearms. 
He looked up suddenly when my presence snapped him out of his concentration. His eyes were a pale blue, yet possessed a hardness not befitting a shopkeeper. His forearm tattoos confirmed my suspicion. Ex-military. The rural shop in such an isolated location was probably the result of his own yearning for a quieter, more subdued existence. I hoped he was having more success than I was. Good morning, I said, trying my best to sound friendly. Morning, came the gruff reply as he lumbered into an upright position. He was a lot taller than I had first reckoned, and would not look out of place working the doors in a rough East London nightclub. Feeling the need to purchase something, I picked up a bottle of water and a local newspaper from the stack, knowing I would never actually read it. Just these, please, I said awkwardly, placing them on the counter. That'll be forty pence. I quickly handed over the money. Staying local, are you? Yes, I'm renting a cottage near the lake about two miles up the road. Oh, of course, yeah. The old Evans place. His demeanor softening just a little. Saw you there yesterday morning when I was out making deliveries. The Evans passed away a few years back, and the daughter now lets the place out to tourists. She didn't want to live there, apparently. Getting a fancy job in the city is what I heard. Nice little place, though. He paused briefly. Listen, mate, just a word of advice, but do be careful if you head into the woods by yourself. Valen Forest is vast and can be a very disorienting place if you don't know it well. The last thing we locals need is to send out another party of volunteers to search for hikers who have gone and got themselves lost. Thanks, I'll bear that in mind, I replied. Is there a mechanic in town? I'm having an issue with my car. It won't start. Not here, mate, but there's one in the next town over, but that's nearly twenty miles away. Oh, I see. I sighed wearily. Do you have a number for them at all? Yeah, mate, just a second. He disappeared into the back room for a few minutes before emerging with a number scrawled on a post-it note. Here you go. There's a payphone on the other side of the village. You give him a call. He'll sort you out. Anyway, what's your name? He inquired. Sean. I'm Frank. I'm open most days if you need anything and can deliver too if needs be. Just let me know. I quickly said my goodbyes, located the overgrown payphone that looked as though it hadn't been used in years, and dialed the number on an ancient and corroded keypad. Hello? A voice answered, its timbre thin and crackly. Hi, is this the mechanic? It is, mate. How can I help? I'm having issues with my car. The engine appears dead. Won't turn over at all, and I'm trying to get home. I'm staying in a small cottage near the lake just outside Wellsbrook. The old Evans place, apparently, if that means anything to you. It does, mate. I can come tomorrow afternoon, if that's any use. Can you not come sooner? I'm actually rather keen to be on my way. Nah, sorry, mate. It'll be tomorrow afternoon at the earliest. Best I can do, sorry. Realizing I had little choice in the matter, I agreed to the time and made my way back to Frank's shop, picking up a bottle of Jim Beam to help me get through the night to come. On the journey home, I pondered my predicament. Had the events of the last few years, which started with Charlotte's death and culminated in my divorce from Elizabeth, really damaged my mind to such an extent? Was it possible that the degree of my mental decline had only really become apparent once I had isolated myself in such a rural area as this? A more immediate concern was how I would survive the night to come. That thing was bound to return to torment me again. When I arrived back at the cottage, I quickly ate and then prepared the place to leave for good the following morning. This would be the last night I would ever spend in this place. I would be walking home if the car could not be fixed, whatever it took. 
I then sat and drank straight from the bottle. I had drained half of it before long. Even so, the gnawing anxiety remained, so I kept drinking until I succumbed to intoxication and exhaustion so completely that I staggered through to the bedroom and collapsed on the bed, the oblivion of sleep consuming me instantly, the sanctuary of nothingness. I awoke once more gasping for air, initially unsure of my surroundings until the reality of the past few days swarmed my mind. It was dark outside, and the hands of my watch although difficult to discern in the gloom, told me it was 3 a.m. My mouth was bone dry and nausea churned in my stomach. A subtle movement, like the flitting of a shadow, drew my attention to the foot of the bed where she stood. A tall, black, twisted form with a radiant yet penetrating gaze a silent voyeur that had watched me sleep for a time undetermined. My senses swayed as she crept up my paralyzed body, Bezleth, the Eater of Light. She seized me with hands that were impossibly large for a woman and brutally strong, pushing my head down into the bed with horrifying force. Her mouth split open like a serrated laceration, a gaping maw of obsidian teeth. From her open mouth, a sound emerged, like the thunderous roar of a waterfall, and her body shook with the sheer violence of it. An icy cold seeped into the top of my skull as she poured her essence into me, as though I were a vacant vessel to be filled. I lay motionless and powerless as her form began to fade, dissipating like cinders in the rain, until I found myself alone. The room plunged into a sudden stillness. Then, the voices began to emanate from within me, and I knew that I had finally succumbed to this malevolent being that dwells in the absence of light. It is dawn now and the morning grows like an open wound in the veiled windows of the cottage. I resent its presence. It is intrusive, like a sordid scrutiny of a peeping tom, and I find myself both fearing and dreading the light. I do not remember doing so, but I have positioned a chair in the center of the living room, and clawed away the ceiling plaster to expose a heavy wooden beam. My hands still bleed profusely from the frantic efforts of this. The long wire from the ancient TV has been tied around the beam, and there is a wide, open noose at the other end that sways hypnotically in slow, circular motions as I continue to stare at it with an unwavering gaze from my position on the floor. Charlotte continues to cry for me, and many voices beckon me to the void. I am no longer afraid. Soon, I will be joining them. A foreword from compendium owner Madame Nell Lockwood. It starts with a rhythmic tap. It ends when your joints go snap. That's the nature and danger of the skin dancer. Nobody knows where they came from, only that they've always been there. First through town rumors, then hushed voices, and finally only through the lens of the certified insane. I myself once heard the enticing thralls of a skin dancer outside my study window. I dared not look upon it, instead sending out my manservant, Manfred, to investigate. He did not return. I took it upon myself to then board up my home and ignore all contact for six months. It was lonely, but I think I starved the bugger out. Never again will I live near any godforsaken forests or woodland areas. 
Too many bugs and far too many things I don't fully understand yet. Skin dancers are the worst kind of creature. One that preys on children. If you see something dancing in the woods, for the love of whatever deity or elder one you worship, vacate where you live and never return. It owns that home now. It was always hard for my wife and me to see our daughter's attempts to communicate always end in frustration and tears. Camille had been born with Alilia, a form of speech delay that the experts assured us she would outgrow as she got older. But there we were, seven years later, and unable to even hear how our daughter's day went without it turning into slammed doors. I can't begin to tell you how many times I convinced myself it was somehow my fault that my DNA was what had corrupted our girl. My wife, Teresa, took it harder. Being unable to communicate with her own child fractured her badly, leading to her spending the daylight hours drinking and her evenings pacing the hallways, trying to figure out methods for Camille to converse, failing to understand that support was needed more than constant solutions. I've done everything in my power to make my family more comfortable in those formative years of Camille's life. I moved us across the country when Camille was in the first grade because her school was ill-equipped for someone who was mute and she was unable to make friends. I enrolled her in a specialist school to help bolster her skills and even changed jobs to accommodate her schedule more easily. Our new home was situated in a beautiful suburban area with a sprawling backyard that connected to the woods. Camille loved adventuring and exploring, so I hoped this would bring her out of her shell. Deep down, I just wanted her to know in any way possible that I was doing the best for her as her father. Camille, to her credit, was a bright young child that could be perceptible beyond her years and, in time, would utilize her intellect to communicate with us through sign language and her journal. I took to the ASL language quickly, but my wife struggled to pick it up and would ultimately dismiss the practice entirely, opting to put her faith in prayer and what she called church therapy, convinced that the Lord was testing her faith by putting her and Camille through suffering. This would result in more than one occasion where I came home to find her standing over Camille shouting about the devil withholding her vocal cords and that drastic measures needed to be taken. When she began to shake and obviously frightened Camille while screaming that the devil was inside her, I knew that no amount of conversation was going to get through to her, so I filed for divorce. My wife tried to fight it, but thanks to the nest cam footage of her exercising our daughter, I was granted full custody. It was tough, but necessary. Teresa moved out quickly, assuring Camille she'd see her again soon with a wink, before giving me a cold stare and slamming the door. I stood there for a moment as I watched the woman I loved leaving our home in Maine, and the life we'd built before I felt a small tug at my sleeve as Camille stared up at me, her auburn hair tied up in space buns and her big blue eyes piercing my soul. I felt myself welling up, but I sat down with her and began signing. Mom and I have had to take some time apart, baby. I slowly signed, nowhere near the skill level I needed, to be for a conversation like this, but I had no choice. Camille stared at me for a moment, processing the situation, and obviously trying to formulate the words in her mind carefully. This is my fault, isn't it? She slowly signed, her hand shaking ever so slightly. If I wasn't like this, we'd be... No, I signed back, also vocalizing it silently, so she could see the firmness in my statement. You are perfect just how you are. This is Mommy's issue to deal with, not yours, I promise. I believed it, too. After a year and a half of learning ASL... This was just a natural part of my life, and anything that allowed me to get into Camille's world was worth any sacrifice. Teresa's frustration and pain were understandable, 
but these faith healings were not the way to go. Mommy will be back soon, I promise. I signed back slowly, trying to make sure I didn't make false promises. I still wasn't totally comfortable with her being anywhere near my daughter after what I'd seen, but this wasn't as simple as my desires. Camille stared at me for a minute before sighing, giving me a nod, and reaching her arms out for a hug. I held her as she silently wept into my shoulder. Over the next few months, Camille tried to understand that Mom wasn't coming back. The supervised visits never happened, as Teresa kept no showing for them. And no amount of furious voicemails I left seemed to do any good. The last straw was Camille's tenth birthday, two months after Teresa left. Watching Camille burst into tears on her birthday was the biggest gut punch I could have ever imagined. And I could do nothing to fix it. When calling Teresa's parents, I was met with obstinance and ignorance, spouting the exact same nonsense about the devil that their daughter had tried to impart onto Camille. Eventually, I got drunk and, against my better judgment, left yet another voicemail telling her, in not-so-kind words, that she'd destroyed our daughter's trust in her irrevocably by trusting an imaginary friend over the life she created that has tangible thoughts and feelings, and to take her god and shove it up her ass. Not my proudest moment, I'll admit, but there's only so many times you can see the mother of your child let her down. Teresa never returned my calls, and after that, Camille stopped asking about her. She regressed into her room, and I'd even occasionally catch her trying to play pretend with the stuffed animals she had in her room signing to them as if it were her mom and telling them about her day. She found a coping mechanism, and while it was hard to watch, I was happy for anything to help her move past this. She still needed space, and I wanted to give her that. Ten years old is a tough time for her to know such things, and I needed to be supportive, not pushy. So when I prepared to leave for a conference in the next town, leaving her with a babysitter, she asked to spend the day in her room writing and watching TV until late. I didn't protest. My babysitter, Brianna, was an ideal fit for Camille. Brianna was 18 years old and born deaf but had cochlear implants, meaning I could call her if I needed to, but she could sign perfectly with Camille. It was like her big sister she never had, and having her around pulled Camille out of her shell immensely. Brianna was bright. She was a kind young woman and seemed taken with Camille. Her father, Dale, was a good neighbor and someone I knew I could trust if things ever took a turn. While I was still hesitant to leave, I knew at least she was in good hands. Daddy, how much do you love me? She signed to me as I got ready to go out the door, more upset than usual. I kneeled down and signed back slowly. More than words can say. I smiled and got a grin in return, kissing her forehead, before nodding to the babysitter. I'll be back the day after tomorrow. Camille won't be a bother, I promise. You have my number if you need anything. I handed the babysitter some money for extra pizza and began my journey to the airport. It must have been around 4 a.m. when my phone began buzzing with a FaceTime request from Camille. Exhausted, but on instinct, I propped the phone up on my case and began signing as my eyes adjusted to the darkness. Baby, it's very late. Is everything okay? I signed, waiting in the pitch-black silence for an answer, but none came. Instead, the sound of a light gurgling filled my ears and made my hair stand on end. It sounded almost pained, like someone had ingested mouthwash and was struggling to lean her head forward to spit it out. I snapped awake and stared at the black screen, but I could barely make out the shape moving in front of me, the pixels giving way as it flexed and bent around the screen. Fear beginning to grip me, I signed again as I heard a tapping accompanying the gurgling. Camille, if you can see me, I need you to show me, baby, or I'm going to call the police. I signed back, the tapping, repeating the rhythm, as the shape still moved. A car passed by the curtain to my daughter's room, 
and I saw what was dancing on the screen. My muscles cramped up, and I reached for the phone by my bedside, immediately calling the babysitter. She was disheveled, almost emaciated, and looked nearly completely naked, save for a ragged white cloth, covering her chest and hips. Her skin was ripped, and wounds were openly bleeding down her body. Some were oozing black blood, while others seeped as if they were pustules. Her face was almost completely obscured by thick matted hair that ran down her face and covered all but her mouth. Her head jerked in an upwards fashion. Her body moved in an unnatural way, the cadence of her taps coming from what I could only assume were her joints, snapping around as she maneuvered in my daughter's bedroom. It was just a few seconds, but it will stay with me for the rest of my life. No sooner had the image faded back into the near darkness, the babysitter picked up the phone, sleepily answering. Uh, Mr. Watson, what is it? Brianna, someone's in the house. They're in Camille's room. I need you to get to your dad's. He's got a gun. Get him to go back into the house now. I'll call the police, okay? There was a long pause, longer than I would have liked in the situation, before Brianna, now more alert, answered quickly. Mr. Watson, Camille is asleep next to me on the couch. We watched movies all night. I'll get her up and do what you say, okay? The sounds of Brianna picking up Camille and taking her to the door filled me with some degree of relief. Over the next few minutes, she found her dad, and they ventured back over to the house, gun in hand. On my phone, I could still see the darkened shape moving and gurgling as I heard footsteps echoing up toward Camille's room. But as soon as they turned on the light, there was no figure dancing on the screen. Instead of relief, however, I felt dread. Because there were two things in that room that set me on my journey home a day early and began the waking nightmare I live with to this day. The first was a series of drawings that had been ripped from a pink journal and scattered all over the floor, some stuck to the walls. While they weren't easy to make out on the phone, my neighbor Dale described some of them as drawings of a thin woman covered in sores, always in different poses in each photo, like a dance of sorts. The second was far more chilling, and was the primary reason I got straight into my car and drove home. The window behind the dancing figure was broken. Glass was strewn across the yard, with the trail leading to the woods connected to our backyard. The next couple of days were punctuated by concerned calls to family members, grateful talks with the neighbor, and angry voicemails left with the police after they said there wasn't much to do beyond put locks on your windows and we'll patrol when we can. I sat down with Camille when things died down and tried to ask her about the journal, but she was unusually defensive and almost frightened to discuss whatever she'd written in there. You know, whatever you wrote, no matter how mean it is about me or Mom, I won't be upset. I signed to her, hoping to reassure her. I'll understand if you're mad and need to say those things. But Camille didn't write negative things about either one of us. In fact, she didn't write anything at all about us. After a few minutes of silence, Camille looked around the living room and signed back shakily. She came to me six days after Mom left. She looked just like Mom, but dirtier. She couldn't talk and she struggled to understand me when I signed, so it took some time to understand each other, she began. Every sign held such hesitation, and I could do nothing but watch. Those first nights were short meetings. She would appear in the corner, her legs would move weird, and she'd never walk anywhere, always this kind of shuffle, I guess. She'd get close to my bed. Her hand would reach out to touch my forehead. But she'd stop and shuffle quickly to my window, pointing at the forest before making that sound and leaving. She looked at me almost shamefully as she stopped. I was still unsure what was going on and felt it better to hear her out entirely than try to question everything at once. But after some time, she learned to sign in a different way, 
through her dancing. I would sign, and she'd respond with a dance move that I somehow understood. She said she'd watched me from the forest as I moved in. She felt my pain when Mom would yell at me, shake me, call me names. She wanted, wants, to adopt me and be my new mommy. But she cast her gaze toward our backyard, the forest, a few hundred yards away, now ancient, foreboding and downright menacing, rather than a welcoming sight of nature and solitude. Each tree rising high like black spires so closely clustered together that all light beyond the first five feet is totally gone. A black canvas filled with the eyes of untold creatures sat watching us as we watched them. I felt a strong sense of unease wash over me as I looked back at Camille, tapping her thigh as she continued to stare into the yard. But she asked me to do something that made me wonder if she was real, and that scared me. I told her to go away, and she got angry. She started pulling at her skin, and her eyes grew wide, and she stared beyond me, past me, and to the wall behind me. A gurgling sound filled the room as my eyes fixated on Camille, my instincts screaming at me not to turn around as we sat in the middle of my living room. But logic kept me centered, and I had another concern mounting in my mind that I dared not share with her. That skin isn't her skin. She signed back slowly, deliberately, as she kept her eyes on whatever was behind me. Camille... Look at me, honey. I promise you that she's not real. I tried to smile, but the situation was growing worse. Camille began shaking as her signs got faster and her lip trembled. She came from the pit. She'll return to the pit with me. We'll go to the land where the sun never shines. She finally looked at me and I saw the absolute terror in her face. I don't want to go, Daddy. I'm so sorry. She leapt up and ran to her room before I could stop her, slamming the door and sitting against it as I knocked, trying to get her to communicate. But without seeing her and being able to sign, it was pretty difficult. Baby, I just want to know you're okay. One knock for yes, two for no, okay? Knock, knock. I frowned. I was beginning to worry the same issues that plagued her mother had begun to find their way into my daughter. For a long time, I wasn't convinced that Teresa was well, and the bouts of mania, delusions of grandeur and speaking with God, culminated in a visit to a psychiatrist who confirmed my suspicions. Schizophrenia. I dared not tell Camille the truth, in part due to her age, and because the fear of it being passed down was all too real for me. But now things were different. I need to finish our conversation with you. Can we do that soon? I asked, hoping she would come around. Thump. It wasn't a knock, but I took it as a yes. Okay. I'll give you some space and come back later. I love you more than words can say. Remember that. I went back downstairs and tried to focus on next steps. I made some calls to friends asking for advice and settled on a meeting with a psychiatrist at the recommendation of her physician, hoping if we caught it early it was treatable. It was a couple hours later and I decided, before I went back up to check on Camille, I'd call her grandparents and at least inform them of what happened so they could pass it on to Teresa, even if I didn't want her actively in Camille's life. However, when I tried calling... The phone simply timed out whenever I tried, and I was unable to reach their inbox to even leave a message. Perplexed, I opened up my laptop and began to boot up Skype, hoping to get them somehow and provide an update, but as it booted up, I saw they weren't online, and I sank back into my chair and pinched the bridge of my nose in frustration. Then I noticed my Nest Cam app was working and I was able to see a shadow from Camille's room. Something was moving out of view, and I wasn't able to discern what, but it made me uneasy. I left the laptop open and walked upstairs, knocking on her door. No answer. 
I could hear a faint series of taps and thuds as I sat in silence, waiting for some kind of reply from her. After a few moments, I caught glimpses of a shadow moving underneath the door frame and decided to look, hoping it was just a case of Camille having her headphones in and not noticing me. I was instead greeted by the sight of my daughter bent over backwards, her palms and the soles of her feet facing inward as her back kept clicking further and further inwards, her head snapping as it cranked further back, each finger and toe making a rhythmic tapping sound that faintly resembled a beat. Within a few moments, her body collapsed to the floor, stomach first, her left foot now tapping incessantly as her leg lurched forward towards her face before the other joined it. Ligaments tore as her top half slid underneath her legs and snapped up, contorting faster and more aggressively as she spun around the room. Outside of my view, I could hear a gurgling and a reciprocal tapping. Something was very, very wrong, and I knew I had to get in there. Without a second thought, I began forcing my shoulder against the door, the wood buckling under the pressure, but holding steady as I shouted her name. Camille! Stay there, baby. I'm coming. You'll be okay. With a third lunge forward, the door gave way and I stumbled forward. The drawings from her journal were still scattered about the room as a once-repaired window was now wide open, the wind blowing while the trees leaned menacingly forward at its command. My daughter was gone. I called the police and informed them someone had taken my daughter away, possibly the same woman I saw the other night, that my daughter said she befriended. Do you have anyone in mind she'd go willingly with? Anyone she trusted? The detective asked me, tired but sympathetic eyes staring back at me. My mind thought back on the way Camille had behaved, the secrecy, talking to things that weren't there, and even the movements. I couldn't help but wonder. My wife, we separated because of how she was treating Camille, and well, she's not well mental health problems. I trailed off, almost feeling ashamed with myself, for explaining it as if this was still somehow my fault. The detective, to his credit, either didn't notice or didn't acknowledge it. I gave him an address and her family's details, assuring him that someone would know where she was. We'll follow up with that immediately. Until then, I need you to stay here and wait. Sometimes when a child runs away, they turn back up home. If your wife did take her, there's still a chance she might drop her back home without issue. He leaned in and put a hand on my shoulder. We'll find your daughter, don't worry. I spent the evening in a haze, staring out at my backyard and sipping a drink my wife had bought me last Christmas. I didn't even taste it, but the numbing aspect helped me forget the things I'd seen over the last few days. After a while, I went up to Camille's room and figured that maybe reading her journal, though an invasion of privacy no dad should ever encroach on, would perhaps help me better understand what was going on in her mind. Before I could process everything I'm seeing, the laptop begins chiming downstairs. I head down to inspect and see the caller ID as Teresa's parents. I frantically pick up and try to keep my words calm and to the point. Ella? Roy? Camille's gone. She's been taken. W w what? What do you mean she's taken? Did, did some pervert nab her in the night? My mother-in-law shrieks back, the panic obvious in her voice, as my father-in-law begins to talk to her. No, Ella. I think Teresa took her. I don't think she's been taking her meds and she's clearly not looking after herself. Camille said she'd been talking to a new mommy that looked just like Teresa but dirtier. I've tried calling Teresa dozens of times over the past few months, and I never thought she'd have just gone off the face of the earth. I couldn't even reach you for answers. What's going on? I lose my cool, my face feeling hot, and tears running down my face as those last words escape me. Where's my baby girl? It was a very long pause, and I can hear discussion in the background, before the phone is passed over to Roy, who speaks in a more concerned voice than I've ever heard from him in the 17 years I've known the man. Paul, 
Teresa was committed 60 days ago for trying to stab a postal worker. She thought he was the devil in disguise and that it was her duty to carry out God's will. She said she'd heard God talking to her through the toaster. He trailed off, the pain in his voice too sincere to be deception. We didn't tell you because, well, we didn't know how. We wanted to, honest, we did. But letting our little Cammie know her mom had just gone crazy, just, it didn't sit right with us. And we were hoping she'd be better soon and this could go behind us. My hands were balling into fists, and I could feel the nails digging into my flesh so intensely that the blood was dripping down my fingers. We didn't want to ruin her chances of ever seeing her daughter again. You understand, don't you? No, no, Roy, I don't. My baby is out there with a stranger, and I just told the police it was the person she thinks is her mom. Do you have any idea what this means? Now, we can talk about this later. What we need to do now is focus on... Well, I slammed the laptop shut and immediately called the detective, leaving him a frantic voicemail as I step out to go to my neighbors, the cold night air hitting me in the face as I push forward. Dale, you got that automatic shotgun? I ask him, stone-faced and probably smelling of booze. Yeah, I do. Paul, you gotta let the detectives do their job. They can't do it quick enough, trust me, Dale. I stare at him, knowing full well how bad this looks. I need the gun, now. Dale shuffles awkwardly on the porch step, taking in the situation in front of him. Paul... If they don't find anything tonight, I'll go with you myself tomorrow. But for now, you need to wait. He looks at me with sympathy, hoping to quell my anger. Dale, what would you do if it was your daughter in those woods? I ask him coldly, not averting my eyes even when he looks away. He doesn't reply. He nods and stepped into the house for a few minutes. I pace in the porch while I wait, seeing his daughter Brianna staring at me from the kitchen window. She walks around to speak to me. She's gone, isn't she? She asks, her voice cracking. I just nod, refusing to stop moving, as I wait for Dale to get back. Oh, God. So she actually did it. I stop pacing, staring at her. Did... did what, Brianna? What did she do? I step forward, eyes now fixed on her face. What... What did she do? When you left, she went up to her room for a bit before bringing down the journal she'd been writing in. I was interested, and I asked her about it. She asked me if I could keep a secret, and I said yes. She showed me the journal, and aside from the words, new mom, it was just drawings of, well, it looked like her mom. But each photo showed a different pose, and her skin got worse. Brianna rubbed her arms as she described it. With each drawing, she got bigger on the page. Her features became deformed. And on the last one... Oh, Paul, I'm so sorry. What? What was it? Brianna, if you don't tell me, the police will ask you themselves. My heart was pounding in my chest. The last one was her, covered in blood. She was holding hands with the new mom in a dark pit, and above them... There was just a pile of blood and the skin on the floor. She wrote something on the back of it, but I didn't see that. There was a silence as Dale's footsteps came closer, and he handed me the shotgun. Paul, if I'd known this was real, I'd have said something, I promise. Brianna pleaded tears running down her face. I never, I never imagined she'd, no, oh God... I nod to Dale before rushing back to the house, not saying a word to either one of them. The house felt cold and desolate as I stepped inside and made my way to her room, trying to find the page Brianna described. It took a bit of searching, but I came across it, hanging above her bed. It was vile. Her small frame devoid of all skin, hiding in a deep black pit, surrounded by trees, holding hands with the elongated figure of something. Something so unnatural that I had to resist every urge not to rip it up the moment I saw it. 
I gazed further down the page and saw a pile of skin and blood displayed like a fresh kill, the black writing on the back seeping through and daring me to look. I took the page from the wall and turned it over to read what it said, gun still gripped firmly in my hand. Here lies Daddy's skin. Then he can dance like us. Join us in the pit. A new family. The gurgling sound returned, followed by a wet slorp sound in my kitchen as I raced downstairs, slipping on the floor as I turned the corner and my head colliding with the coffee table in a thunderous crash. My vision blurred and with my head thumping, I see a shape dance unnaturally towards me, limbs crunching and torso twisting as the innumerable gurgles and clicks fill my ears until it's deafening. I shut my eyes out of pain and feel it rear up close to me, grabbing my face with two appendages and pulling it close, its lips touching my forehead before it utters five words that shatter my soul beyond repair each one accompanied by a shuffle as it gets farther away from me. More than words can say. Then I woke up. I was being tended to outside by police and paramedics. Tape was strewn all across my property as thick black bags were taken by men and women in hazmat suits. Everyone looked at me with such sympathy. I didn't need to ask why. They said it was most likely a bear attack, that the two, or maybe even just Camille, had gotten lost in the woods, attacked by the bear on their way back, and ripped to pieces as it tried to find more food here. Her beautiful hair, the main identifier. They were convinced and offered me condolences as they wrapped things up. But I knew better. I still do. I know that there's something in those woods that takes the form of something it knows it can prey upon. It wears the skin of a loved one to lure you in, but whatever is underneath. It's something I never wish to understand. It's been six months, and it gurgles to me every night, beckoning me from the entrance to the woods. Sometimes I'll look on a long evening, a bottle of rum in hand, and see two shapes dancing from afar, too distant to make out features, but I know it's them. I know it didn't want to be her mother. My wife and her family have been calling regularly, as have the neighbors, but I don't answer anymore. I know what's waiting for me now. I know that they'll eventually get bolder and take me when I'm vulnerable. Truth be told, I miss my baby girl so much that I may just let them but I still have this shotgun, and I've decided when I pass this on to you, I'm going to go into the woods and let fate decide what happens to me. Madam Lockwood, these creatures are real, and they prey upon people who've lost someone dear to them. They live in the deepest parts of the woods, and they still don't know what they want. But I do know that they're beyond anything we could ever understand or beat. It wants my skin. I just might let him have it, if I can see my daughter again. Deputy Wayland Dupree winced when the first wave of thunder shook his patrol car. It was low and rumbling, as if the earth beneath him were crashing through the canopy of asphalt to take hold of him. The heavy rain came soon after. He struggled against the high winds to stay on the road. Add in some of that telekinesis and telepathy stuff, and you've got yourself something right out of a Stephen King novel. At 21, Whalen was the youngest deputy in the Bidwell County Sheriff's Department in Weldon, Mississippi, population 109 and a half. It used to be an even 110, but Mervyn Garnell had gone and gotten his legs lopped off while trying to dislodge a raccoon carcass from his combine. 
As the rookie, Whalen had the sublime privilege of working the graveyard shift in a town roughly the size of your average Walmart. Lord of Moses, that wasn't no clap of thunder. That was a dadgum standing ovation. It was almost two in the morning, and Whalen was dog tired. The bottom had dropped out of the rain-heavy sky, and now he couldn't see two feet in front of him. He decided to be sensible about the whole exhaustion-slash-biblical flood thing and find a place to pull over and grab some shut-eye. He knew of a car wash about five miles up the road on State Road 29, where he could swing into one of those outdoor stalls and nod off till the storm passed. Whalen was well acquainted with the area. He had grown up in the pinprick town of Blytheville. For well over a century, his kinfolk had filled the graveyards of Weldon, Blytheville, and nearby Buckhorn. His family's sweat and bones were in the soil of each of the small farming communities. Everybody knew each other. Most were related in some way or another. As denizens of the peaceful rural life, their biggest concern centered around increasing their crops' yields and not accidentally coming on to their cousin in a bar. But there was also the unspoken yearning to run away from the land that absorbed its people like a sponge in a hurricane. The place never quite let you go. It sure hadn't let go of Waylon. Waylon took his time getting to the car wash. This wasn't the time for hot riding. He pulled into one of the open stalls and killed the old Crown Vic's massive 250 horsepower V8 monster motor. He sank into the well-worn butt crater bequeathed him by his lard bottom predecessor, the newly and thankfully retired Big Mick Harvey. Waylon was just about to cross over into Snoozeville, USA when the booming voice of Deb from Dispatch blared from the radio. The fearless female officer was a boisterous, hard-drinking, rough-and-tumble kind of gal whom the boys at the department clandestinely referred to as Old Glory. The name had come about because each of them claimed to have been on top of her at some point. Waylon. Oh, Waylon. Boy, are you asleep out there? Just grunt and let me know you're alive. I'm here, Deb. What's up? I got a good one for you. You remember old Mabel Luckabee? Mabel was the stuff of legend in their neck of the woods. She was a mean old cuss who never met a person she could tolerate or a deodorant she couldn't overcome. If cleanliness is next to godliness, then Mabel was the Antichrist. She was now well into her 70s and living alone in her raggedy two-story farmhouse in Weldon. A widow by vocation, some of the townsfolks opined that her last husband, Ed, had passed away not because of any mishap or disease, but because, like the other poor SOBs before him, he'd wanted to. Not long after, his blue tick hound dog, Buckethead, decided to go AWOL. Everybody figured, with Ed gone, the dog must have thought, no, no, you don't, and taken off for parts unknown. Mabel was an equal opportunity offender. She hated everyone, regardless of race, creed, or species. Her scowl and moonscape of a face filled Waylon's mind, making him grimace. What about her? he asked. Did she ugly away or something? Dern woman looks like the love child of Steve Buscemi and Elma the Yak Lady. Don't know yet. I just got a call from Doreen, her nosy night owl neighbor. Says she ain't seen her since Monday. That's two days ago. Doreen's tried calling her, but she won't answer the phone. She's also said the house lights have been on the whole time. I need you to do a welfare check. I know she's a pain, so just peek in her window and see if she's moving around. Uh, can't we just wait a few days to see if the buzzards are circling her house? Come on now, Waylon. You and me both know two things. One... The buzzards won't go anywhere near her because it might lower their culinary standards. And two, you ain't got nothing better to do. Deb, the only thing worse than finding that old hag alive would be finding her dead. Well, if she is, her funeral's gonna draw quite a crowd. Why? Nobody can stand her. 
That's true, but you know what they say. Give the people what they want, and they'll show up in droves. Ha <laughs> ha Fair point. All right, then, I'm on my way. The rain had begun to ease off, but the thunder and lightning were still raising a fuss. Waylon was thankful for the graveled lane that led up to the Luckabee house. Otherwise, he would have had to swim for it. After roughly 30 yards of potholes and low-hanging tree limbs, he pulled up to the decrepit old place. Waylon had been there a few times during his childhood to chuck rocks and cherry bombs, but with the storm still laying haymakers, the house looked more foreboding than he remembered. The lengthy shards of white paint that the claws of time had carved away made it look like a large potato that had gone a few rounds with an angry vegetable peeler. Its tattered roof sloped down to rusty gutters from which lush, rambling gardens of weeds flourished. Looming from the blackness, the eerie eyesore brought to Wayland's mind an exterior set from a Rob Zombie movie. Wayland grabbed a small mag light from his service belt, put on his plastic-covered deputy's hat, and jogged to the house's front porch. Its weak structural integrity gave him pause. This porch makes me think of Mabel, old, nasty, and sagging in all the worst places. Waylon looked through the windows but didn't see anyone. He pounded on the door. No one answered, so he banged harder. Mrs. Luckabee! Oh, Mrs. Luckabee! Sheriff's Department! Mrs. Luckabee, you in there? When he failed to get a response, he tried the doorknob. Mabel had left the door unlocked, so he stepped inside. Waylon walked through the house's main floor, calling the elderly woman's name. But all was still and silent. With each step, the sticky wooden floorboards groaned as if they were dying. As he went from one disheveled room to another, he was amazed and appalled at the amount of debris that Mabel had hoarded. There were several dozen unopened boxes from QVC, old clothes and magazines, dusty porcelain dolls, and other creepy items that might indicate someone wearing a skin suit was about to come at you with a running chainsaw. Girl, you are seriously messed up. As he ventured further into the cramped house, a nostril-searing stench hit him square in the nose. Hoo-wee! Smells like feet, farts, and Fritos in here. Waylon headed up the stairs to check out what he figured might be a bedroom, a bathroom, and given the vibe of the creepy dump, a possible kill room. When he reached the second floor landing, he heard a faint sound coming from one of the rooms. Mrs. Luckabee? That you? He followed the noise to one of the rooms and found the door ajar. He pushed it open and saw Mabel lying on her bed. Dressed in a dingy white nightgown, she was propped up on a pillow, staring at a small portable TV located on a dresser near the bed's foot. Oh, hey, Mrs. Luckabee. You probably don't remember me, but I'm Don and Linda Dupree's boy, Waylon. I come by to check on you. You okay? Mabel didn't acknowledge his presence in any way. She just kept staring blankly at the TV as if it had hypnotized her. I'm sorry to bother you, but I need to make sure you're all right. Are you? All right, I mean. Mabel continued to ignore him, so he walked between her and the TV. She kept looking ahead as if he weren't there. Waylon went to grab hold of her toes and give them a shake. But when he saw the thick curled nails, he poked her foot with the hand-sized mag light instead. Note to self, destroy my flashlight. When she didn't respond, Waylon walked around to the side of the bed. He leaned in close to her and whispered. 
Mrs. Luckabee? Mrs. Luckabee. He pushed the side of her greasy head with the tip of his magli, and she keeled over on her side. Judas on the tricycle. Waylon felt for a pulse but found none. Then he heard a faint scratching as Mabel's bottom lip began pulsing outward. He held back his sickness when two large brown cockroaches exited her mouth. After pulling in a few deep breaths to quell his disgust, he pressed the talk button on his shoulder radio. Deb, Waylon here. Pick up. The radio crackled and Deb's voice filled the room, too loud for Waylon's taste. What's up, Waylon? How's the wicked witch of Weldon? Why don't you ask her? She's standing right here. He chuckled at poor Deb's expense. Oh, uh, sorry about that, Mrs. Luckabee. I was just... <laughs> it's all right, Deb. She can't hear you. She's deader than Kevin Spacey's acting career. Oh, crap. Really? Yep. In fact, you can call her whatever you want. She ain't coming. Well, ain't you nice? Didn't your mama ever tell you never to speak ill of the dead? Though I guess we can make an exception in old Mabel's case. It ain't like she's gone to mind. You know, I don't mean the old guy no disrespect, but the only way I'm gonna be able to squirt a tear during this here tender moment is if I yank out a nose hair. Whatever. Listen, call in a... Waylon bent his head away from the radio's high-pitched whine. Deb, are you there? Wait. Where? God. Get out. Struggling to communicate with Deb, Waylon retreated downstairs in search of a better signal. Deb, can you hear me? He was relieved when she answered. Yeah, I can hear you, but barely. You keep bobbing and weaving on me. Listen, I've already let Dave, I mean the sheriff, know about Mabel. I won't repeat what he called her. He's still on his fishing trip, so he won't be there till almost sunup. I also contacted the first responders down in Camford, but they're at least a half hour out. Said that the storm had caused some trees and power line damage, so it may be even longer. Just sit tight until they arrive. In the meantime, I'm gonna need you to secure the scene and keep watch. Keep watch? You mean like in babysitting a dead body till the meat wagon and the sheriff arrive? Listen, Waylon. I know it seems like a big deal when you're new and all, but it'll be okay. Just make sure you don't disturb nothing. The sheriff will take care of the scene. Just go ahead and start your report. Jeez, Deb. Of all the corpses to be locked in with on a stormy night, I had to draw Mabel Luckabees. A low hum came over the radio. Deb, Deb, you there? Silence. Waylon sighed at first, then decided to make light of his predicament. He held the radio's mic up to his face and announced, Well, hey there, all you night owls. You're listening to W-A-Y-N, where the hits just keep on coming. Then, like a bad omen, the pounding rain returned with a vengeance. Waylon went back upstairs to check out the rest of the second floor. He was happy to find that the upper floor rooms were not as cluttered and dirty as downstairs. When he finished his exploration, he went into Mabel's room, took out his cell phone, and snapped some pics for his report. Once he got that out of the way, he shut off the TV and headed back downstairs to look for coffee. He was halfway down when he heard a loud click followed by the sound of the TV coming on. What the heck is that all about? Waylon re-entered Mabel's bedroom. The old tube television was on and Mabel's body was propped up on the pillow again. Waylon was unnerved and confused. Say, wasn't she? He watched the lifeless body for a few seconds. When it didn't move, he turned off the antiquated boob box, then walked to the door. 
It was on again. Waylon was adhered to the floor, afraid to turn around. He was relieved to observe that when he did, and with only a tad of guilt, Mabel was still dead as a brick. Waylon figured the mystery had a reasonable explanation, so he shifted into seasoned cop mode. He told himself that all he was dealing with was a prehistoric television plugged into the wall socket of an old rickety house with suspect wiring. Piece of crap television, he thought. Things older than Moses' babysitter. Waylon reached behind the TV and yanked its cord from the wall, then glared at the blank screen. Now shut the heck up, or I'm gonna take out my gun and go Scarface on you. Waylon made his way down to the kitchen and began looking through the cracked, faded cabinets for some much-needed java. It took a lot of searching, but he finally found an ancient jar of freeze-dried coffee. The jar was sticky, the grounds clumped together like a rich, robust hockey puck. Waylon had guessed that someone had likely purchased the brown muck sometime during the Clinton administration. Has it come to this? Do I really need caffeine this bad? Begrudgingly, he accepted that he did. He turned his search toward finding a clean cup, as well as something in which to boil water. He flipped on one of the stove's burners and started digging around. When he saw a relatively clean mug, he lifted it as if he had found a holy grail and sang, Ta-da! There was a brilliant flash of lightning, followed by a floor-shaking thunder. Then the power went out. Oh, sweet lady of perpetual nonsense, what now? Waylon thought. Pulling his defiled mag light from his belt, he went looking for the fuse box. He didn't have to look for long. There was one located inside the kitchen's walk-in pantry. Waylon inspected the black briquette that was once the main fuse. Deader than a mean old woman in a farmhouse bedroom, he thought. Dust and dirt trickled down onto Waylon's hat like grimy rain. The sharp noise came from the room directly above him. Mabel's bedroom. His knocking knees betrayed his fear as his breath retreated into his lungs, refusing to come out. On the one hand, he knew it was his duty to go and check on things, but the other hand was telling him to grab the rest of his body and run like a crack-addled gazelle into the raging night. He settled the internal argument by siding with the more sensible hand. Waylon much preferred braving the torrential rain and sitting in his cruiser to stand in what he was rapidly coming to consider the redneck version of Hill House. In addition, he still needed to fill out a report. He was thankful that the paperwork was in the car, thus affording him a plausible case for reasonable cowardice. When Waylon reached the front door, he tried the knob, but it wouldn't turn. Then, as if on cue, a sinister cackle bled through his radio. Making his arm hair stand on end. He began to fear that a powerful supernatural force might be at play. The idea chilled him. Taking a few steps backward, Waylon warned the silent crowd of imaginary gawkers. Stand back, y'all. I'm fixing to make a waylon shaped hole in this door. Then an uncomfortable thought hit him. Oh, for the love of Lucy. The guys at the station will never let me forget it if I run like a little girl from a spooky old house. Gotta tap into my inner Chuck Norris and handle this case like one of the big boys. He drew what he could from a shallow puddle of courage and ventured back upstairs to inspect Mabel's bedroom again. When Waylon got there, his first act was to locate the source of the noises. Confusion collided with unease as he observed that nothing, including the recently departed Mabel, had moved. However, the lack of activity only served to make him more nervous. Screw the guys. I'm done with this place. As Waylon was leaving, the bedspring squeaked, 
followed by the unsettling sounds of somebody scampering away. He turned around and saw that Mabel was literally dead and gone. His skin tingled at the implications. He shined his mag light around the lightless room, praying that the formerly deceased woman wouldn't come running at him from one of the pitch dark corners. Despite the massive storm bellowing outside, the world fell silent for Waylon. The weight of his dread submerged his entire mind in a cold black pool of fear and disbelief. Where's Steve and Elma? The scratchy voice said. Waylon spun around several times, the flashlight's beam hopping around the room like a bouncing ball of light. Suddenly, bare feet slapped across the wooden floor as the thing rushed into the bedroom closet, slamming the door shut. M Mrs. Luckaby, that you? The closet door creaked open halfway, and a shadowy figure crawled out. Its neck made a cracking sound as its head swiveled in Waylon's direction. Glowing yellow eyes peered up at him, numbing his quivering body. He focused a funnel of light on the thing dressed in a nightgown. Mabel's contorted body looked like a pretzel playing a game of Twister. Her breathing was quick and shallow, her frame heaving with every pant. As soon as the light settled on her crinkled face, she squealed and scuttled under the bed. Waylon's twitching hand rested on the butt of his service revolver. With great wariness, he plodded over to Mabel's last known resting place. Why don't you join me down here, Don and Linda's boy? Icy Dot spread across Waylon's sweating body like frigid spiders skittering on bare skin. Against his better judgment and basic common sense, Waylon lowered his head toward the floor. Oh! Alabaster arms shot out of the mattress and gnarled hand seized him by his hat. Screaming, he twisted his head free of the ghostly grip. Waylon sped from the bedroom and toward the staircase. After a few clumsy steps, his feet flew out from under him, landing him on his backside. Helpless against gravity, he tobogganed down the painful steps, farting loudly with each violent bounce. Finally, his noisy hindquarters found the bottom of the stairs. After pulling himself up, Waylon returned to the locked front door. Grabbing the knob with both hands, he used all his strength to turn it, but his efforts proved fruitless. He pressed the button on his radio. Damn! For the love of the Lord, please answer me! The radio was still dead. His next idea was to try to break out through one of the windows. Waylon ran to the living room and tried opening one, but it wouldn't budge. He pushed up on the next one, same result. Desperate, he grabbed a small coffee table and hurled it against the window. It bounced off the glass like a tennis ball. He was about to use his gun to help improve his luck when a coffee mug went sailing past his head, chattering against the impenetrable window. He whirled around and saw the lower back part of Mabel's nightgown disappearing around the kitchen doorway. Waylon yanked a gun from its holster, gripping it tightly in his right hand while holding the mag light in the other. That's enough now. This is Deputy Sheriff Waylon Dupree. You better make yourself known. There was a movement in the dining room. He went to investigate. The dust from the many items stacked around the dim room flittered in the bright ray of the flashlight. Waylon's nerves were bouncing around inside him like a pinball. He steered the beam around the room. I hope you all show up in droves. Quitting time! Waylon sprinted to the front door, where he fired every round in his gun directly at the doorknob only to have them rebound off. His heart was racing as if it were qualifying for the Daytona 500. Let me out of here. Whoever you are, please let me go. 
I'll jump in my squad car and leave right now. Footsteps emanated from the front sitting room. Waylon heard the crackling sound of a phonograph needle making contact with the vinyl. An old school swing style dance number reverberated throughout the downstairs. He recognized the tune as one his grandma listened to whenever she decided to up the dosage of what she called her happy time nerve medicine. It was an old Judy Garland song from the 1960s called Come On Get Happy. Soon, Judy's voice chimed in with a bouncy beat. Forget your troubles, come on, get happy. You better chase all your cares away. Shout hallelujah, come on, get happy. Get ready for the judgment day. Waylon raised his flashlight, holstered his empty pistol, and entered the dark room. His body became one large icicle. The late Mabel Luckabee, her back to him, stood in front of a large wooden stereo cabinet, swaying in time with the teeny sounding tune. Mrs. Luckaby? Mabel? Ma'am? She stopped moving and snapped to attention. Waylon continued. The station house sent me here to ch check on you. Y you was upstairs dead. But clearly, you're feeling better, so I, I guess I'll be leaving now. Waylon watched slack-jawed and bug-eyed as the moving corpse levitated and spun around to face him. He aimed a flashlight at the hag, accentuating her face's pallor. Her yellow eyes blazed with raw hatred. His mind was yelling at him to escape but his body refused to cooperate. He struggled to work up enough spit to speak. <laughs> Ms. Luckaby, I just want to leave and... <laughs> the shrill sound, coupled with the force of her voice, caused all of the first floor windows to burst outwards. Her body flew through the air at Waylon. He shrieked, then hurled the mag light at her as hard as he could. Finally, his mind and body got on the same page, and he fled from the flying corpse. Waylon turned and ran straight for one of the painless windows, launching himself like a twirling meat missile. After landing on the front porch, Waylon rolled into the railing with so much force that his body busted through it and out into the yard. The violent impact made him look like a human bowling ball landing a perfect strike. Just as he was hauling himself up from the thick brown mud, he heard a siren in the distance. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The EMTs were the first on the scene. Dave, the long-suffering sheriff, was still on his way back from his ill-fated fishing trip. They found Waylon standing in the front yard, in the middle of the vicious storm, a thousand-yard stare in his eyes. The team couldn't get anything out of him, so they had him wait in the back of the ambulance while they dealt with Mabel. After 20 minutes or so, one of the paramedics came down to grab some gear and check on Waylon, who was still shell-shocked. You want to tell me what happened in there? The windows are all busted out and the place is a wreck. Was it like that when you got here? Waylon was regaining his wits. He realized that there was no scenario in which the paramedics, or anyone else for that matter, were going to believe him. Resigned to his peculiar predicament, he muttered, Yep. Well, observations like that fall under your authority anyway, the paramedic said. I'll just go on with my job then. He began placing items in a small vinyl bag. Before he left for the house, he turned and said, As soon as we finish up here, I want to take you in for a quick checkup. You look like you might still be in shock. Hell's bells on an Easter bonnet. I thought you boys were supposed to be used to all this stuff. He had only taken a few steps when Waylon called after him. Hey, tell me something. Where'd you find the body? Did you see anything unusual? 
You mean other than the house being beat to crap? We found her upstairs in bed. She was lying back on the pillow staring straight ahead. Creepy as all get out. She must have known the blackout was coming, though. Why is that? She had a small mag light in her hand. Then he left Waylon alone to ponder his sanity. Am I crazy? Or did I let my rookie self get so worked up that I started imagining things? He wondered. What a wuss. Waylon had nearly talked himself down off the 50th floor ledge of the crazy building when the radio in the front cab of the ambulance turned itself on. The sound of Julie Garland's mellifluous voice pushed Waylon off the side of his mental skyscraper as she crooned. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.